webinar today. My name is Terrence Henry and I'm Director of Communications for the Academy of Medicine, Engineering and Science of Texas, also known as TAMIST. Today we're releasing a new report, Environmental and Community Impacts of Shale Development in Texas, authored by the TAMIST Shale Task Force. This is the schedule for our press conference today and we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide so you can see the agenda. Mary Beth Maddox, the Executive Director of TAMIS, will provide an introduction. Then Christine Economides, Chair of the TAMIS Shale Task Force, will present overall, uh, an overall review of the report. After that, we'll hear from one of the authors of each of the report's chapters. So that will take us to 1045, and at that time, we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. You can submit questions for the Q&A through the chat slash qu question function of GoToWebinar in the GoToWebinar pane. The chair and chapter authors will also be available for follow-up interviews throughout the day today. We can send you their contact info after the presentation if you'd like to arrange interviews. As a reminder, the website for our report is tamist.org slash shale task force, and the hashtag that we're using on social is hashtag shale report. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our website later today. Now, I'd like to introduce Mary Beth Maddox, Executive Director of the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas. Thank you, Terrence, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. TAMIS is Texas's premier scientific organization, bringing together the state's best and brightest scientists and researchers. TAMIS is a nonprofit whose membership includes all the Texas-based members of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and the state's Nobel Laureate. Eighteen research universities in the state are TAMIS institutional members. TAMIS works to promote Texas as a destination for outstanding research, supports rising star researches in the state, and serves Texas as an intellectual resource. The TAMIS Board of Directors commissioned this National Academy-style study to help inform state policymakers and the public. The task force makeup includes expert representation from academia, from industry, an NGO, and government. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Christine Economides. She's the chair of the TAMIS Shale Task Force and a professor of petroleum engineering at the University of Houston. Christine? Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, be able to kick this off for our task force members. Uh, we'd like to look at the next slide, please. Uh, so this effort started with a statement of task that's modeled after reports that have been done at the national level uh, by the National Academies. Um, and our ideas here are bulleted briefly. So uh, we were interested to evaluate the scientific basis of available information and communicate the current state of knowledge. Uh, so key steps in this process included reviewing methodologies and approaches, and then we wanted to identify gaps, uh, areas where we could see that uh, some things had not been studied in Texas, uh, and thereby we could uh, suggest improvements and perhaps make in, uh, recommendations, uh, including recommendations for further study. Uh, so. To summarize all this very basically, uh, this is all based on existing peer-reviewed studies and no new research was acquired for this work. Could I have a new slide? So this slide is just listing the members of the task force. Um, and so it's highlighting in bold the six topic areas uh, and each of these will be addressed uh, during our uh, uh, comp uh, our presentations this morning. Uh, so you can see there are six, well you can't see this but I will tell you, there are six university systems represented here. Uh, two companies, ExxonMobil and Pioneer. Uh, one NGO, uh, the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, three Texas agencies including the Railroad Commission, the Bureau of Economic Geology and uh, Texas Transportation Institute. So this is really a wide scope, the study, and uh, we also 
have uh, quite a wide range of perspectives. And uh, one of our goals, which we did uh, achieve, was to achieve a consensus among all these uh, various perspectives. Let me have the next slide. So uh, here, just kind of uh, opening up um, a rationale for all this, uh, Texas has had a wonderful experience and uh, been largely responsible for uh, making game-changing um, initiatives uh, for the entire nation. Uh, so perhaps just a comment. Um, when we say shale, we are not speaking of what geologists would call shale, but rather what we mean uh, is that these are organic rich formations that contain either natural gas, which we'll call shale gas, or oil, which is often called tight oil. Uh, and these formations require multiple hydraulic fractures that are usually created from long horizontal wells. Uh, to be able to produce the hydrocarbons profitably. Uh, so on the left, we can see a map that highlights uh, the major basins in Texas uh, that we're exploiting through uh, this shale experience. And on the right, a couple of graphs, and uh, these are small, uh, so let me just point out to you that the gray part represents the uh, uh, cumulative production that's coming from the rest of the country and all the colors represent the various regions in Texas and that's for the tight oil and the natural gas. Uh, and altogether, uh, this additional hydrocarbon production has changed the United States from a net importer uh, to even an exporter of these resources. Next slide, please. Here we have a collage, and uh, many of these slides you're going to see revisited, so I don't need to spend much time on them. Uh, but uh, we're seeing represented uh, these uh, various topic areas, uh, the transportation, air, water, seismicity, and land. Uh, and uh, I do see that these slides are going to come up later in the presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on them right now. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so this one shows us a graphic that was drawn by one of our task force members, Urs Kreider, and this is highlighting all of the topic areas. You can actually see some numbers there that refer to chapters in the report uh, by number. Uh, so the topic areas, but in the context of the titular focus on environment in the green on the left and communities in the blue on the right. Uh, so uh, we're looking at these two uh, broad levels of impacts uh, on the environment and on people. Uh, and as, as uh, this effort progressed, we learned that there are few studies that actually connect these topic areas. Uh, so the chapters tend to be focused very much on the topic area, but not but occasionally um, mention connections. Um, so uh, we saw this as something that is actually lacking because remember I started by saying that this study is based on studies that have already been done. Uh, so the final chapter uh, offers some insights, insights on why such studies are rare and what it might take uh, to conduct such studies. Uh, so we're looking at this as a possible way forward. Um, so I think the next slide takes us to our next task force, task force member. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're going to move on into the findings and recommendations from each chapter now of the Tamas Shale Task Force report. And we're going to begin with geology and earthquake activity. Brian Stump of Southern Methodist University was the lead author for this chapter. Thank you, Terrence. Um, could we go to the first slide? All right, I'd just like to initially summarize the major findings um, from the geology and earthquake activity section. Um, we live in Texas and there are faults uh, across the state of Texas. One of the interesting things are, is that these faults are poorly and incompletely characterized. 
Um, but it's important to remember that the majority of these known faults are stable and not prone to generating earthquakes. Uh, the second finding was that certainly earthquake activity has increased in Texas since 2008. If we look back over a 30-year time period, we typically would see two earthquakes per year of magnitude 3 and above. Um, moving forward from 2008, that number increased somewhere between 12 and 15 earthquakes a year. The third finding is that some of these earthquakes are linked to wastewater disposal from oil and gas development. Um, but in terms of these larger earthquakes, not hydraulic fracturing, as the state's response to this, seismic monitoring stations in Texas are increasing from 18 to 43 with a funded um, statewide exercise called TexNet. And uh, finally, wastewater disposal wells near earthquake locations now receive special approval from state regulators. So I've got some slides now to emphasize some of those, those points. What you see before you is a map of Texas that uh, delineates the faults. Um, you can see um, in the Gulf region, um, in eastern and northeastern and western Texas, these, these faults that occur across the state. Um, in this map also is this uh, small yellow circles are the earthquake activity in Texas and then the triangles is this uh, new uh, installation of seismic stations across the state. Next slide. This is just a characterization of earthquakes in Texas um, going back to the mid-1970s uh, when the glo um, national network of seismographic stations was adequate to detect, locate all magnitude 3 and above earthquakes. And uh, you can see um, just prior to 2010, um, this relatively rapid increase in, in seismicity that occurred at that time period. Next slide. Um, one of the interesting things, and we'll come to this when we, when we come to the recommendations, is that this is a multidisciplinary problem that involves um, seismologists, geologists, um, petroleum engineers in trying to understand the linkage between wastewater disposal and um, possible earthquakes. And uh, an important part of this is data sharing and expertise sharing. So the arrows on the right hand side indicate that as we share more data, as we share expertise, our understanding of these events is going to increase going forward. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a reminder of uh, TexNet in, in Texas. And uh, so all of these triangles are existing and then new seismic stations that are and have been installed that is going to improve our ability to detect and locate earthquakes across Texas which is kind of the first step in, in understanding if there is any linkage to oil and gas operations. Next slide. And the final one, I believe. So our recommendations are, are threefold. Um, the first is that uh, it's important for us to develop procedures for sharing data across various disciplines in order to move forward with a solution to these kinds of problems. The second thing is that as we share data in the modern environment, um, having standardized data formats um, so we can better integrate different kinds of data, whether it be seismic data, subsurface geologic data, subsurface fault data, and that sharing then facilitates interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, which uh, is a step towards mitigation and avoidance of induced seismicity. Finally, I think it's important to highlight to the um, um, individuals in Texas that uh, TexNet has set a set of goals that has an integrated research profi profile that uh, considers seismic analysis, geologic characterization, fluid flow modeling, and geomechanical analysis that uh, is going to provide us a, a path forward in the state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And we're going to be doing all the Q&A at the end of the presentations. So that'll be uh, hopefully right at 1045. So once we get through all the chapters, findings and recommendations, we'll be doing Q&A all at once at the end.
As a reminder, you can go ahead and submit questions now as you have them in the questions and chat pane on your GoToWebinar window. Now we'll hear from Melinda Taylor from the University of Texas School of Law, who was the lead author of the report's chapter on land resources. Okay, thanks, Terrence. Um, so our, the land subgroup of the task force really looked at land issues in two buckets. We looked at um, what I call, call like kind of environmental impacts of shale development in Texas, um, and then we also looked at the impacts to surface owners, to landowners. And so that's that's how this is organized, these, these slides that give you an overview. The first slide there is just meant to, again, kind of take a take a step back and look at Texas. It's very unique from an ecological standpoint. It's large geographically. Um, it Because it's so large and because it contains you know, lots of different soil types and vegetative patterns and climatic conditions and uh, geologic formations and so forth, we have very, very diverse habitats within Texas. And that leads to a lot of biodiversity. Um, the second highest number of plant and animal species in the country occur in Texas. We're, we're second only to California. We've got a very large number of threatened and endangered species, about 100 species um, that are federally listed occur in Texas. And again, that's a reflection of the fact that we have these different ecoregions across the state that just support a, you know, a wide variety of different species. So next slide, please. The other kind of big picture thing to bear in mind with respect to um, energy development in Texas is that Texas has very little public land. And again, I think most people are aware of that, but it bears <laughs> reinforcement because it is very important in this context. Unlike other states in the West, um, almost all of the, the land in Texas is privately held. This map just gives a you know kind of a scatter shot to give you a sense of where the public land is, is located. But the upshot of that is that almost all of the onshore oil and gas development that occurs in Texas occurs on private land. I mean, there are some exceptions to that, but the majority is on private land. Look at the next slide, please. Now, because it occurs on private land, we don't have as many baseline studies, if you will, of habitat conditions and species occurrences as one might if that activity was occurring on federal land. So, you know, when, when energy companies uh, obtain permits to, to explore and develop energy resources on public lands, they have to go through an environmental review process and that yields some baseline data. And we just don't have that information here in Texas. Um, now, we do know that, it, you know, we, we, we know this quite clearly, that oil and gas development is ubiquitous across the state. Virtually all of the counties in Texas have some oil and gas development going on. Um, and one can look at aerial photos and um, satellite imagery of Texas, and it's very clear that some fragmentation has resulted from that energy development, um, you know, there's, because of the, the infrastructure that's associated with the industry. Um, and we also know that, that, that those land impacts are going to include things like <clears throat> habitat fragmentation, soil erosion, some um, changes in vegetation because different species tend to um, come into disturbed areas after, after uh, well pad sites and so forth are cleared. There can be soil contamination um, and some uh, impacts to property values for landowners. Let's go on to the next slide. But what we don't really have a good handle on because of the lack of that baseline data is how the effects of fragmentation, you know, again, you can look at the aerial photos and see the infrastructure, but we don't have the studies to correlate the impacts of that fragmentation on particular species. So we'll see when we get to the recommendation section that one of the um, recommendations our group is strongly making is that new baseline studies need to be conducted so that we can, as a state, get a better handle on what the impacts are. Um, there is a fairly comprehensive set of data available for the dune sagebrush lizard um, out in the Permian Basin. It's a small species that was considered for listing on the Endangered Species Act a few years ago, and the lesser prairie chicken a species that occurs up in the Panhandle. And we know that those two species are affected by oil and gas development. Um, they're also being addressed through some voluntary programs um, that are in place currently. But again, there's a lack of data with respect to a number of other species. Let's go on to the next slide. 
So quickly summarizing, um, some you know, shifting gears a little bit and talking about the impacts to surface owners. Um, in tech, well, in the United States, the mineral rights, that is the right to develop oil and gas or other minerals on someone's property, can be severed from the right to use the surface. And across Texas, those rights have largely been severed. And depending on the location of, in the particular tract, the surface owner, the owner of the surface rights, may or may not own the mineral rights or some interest in the mineral rights. In those instances where the surface owner does not own any interest in the minerals, the surface owner has very little to say about how the minerals will be developed on his or her property. And the mineral owner has the right to develop those minerals and to use water from the surface and to make reasonable use of the surface um, in connection with extracting those minerals. So we have found in Texas, um, especially since the, the uh, sort of the shale renaissance, shale revolution that's occurred over the last decade or so, that that, that increase in drilling has had some impact on, on those surface owners. And at this point, Texas is the only major shale producing state that does not have what's called a surface damage statute in place. Um, other states, you know, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, um, North Dakota, states all over the country that have experienced a, a dramatic increase in shale development do have this statute in place, which gives surface owners the right to uh, notice from the producers before um, exploration and development occurs and some amount of leverage about how that surface will be impacted from the development of the minerals from their site. So one of the recommendations that we're making is that Texas at least explore the possibility and weigh the pros and cons of a surface damage statute to give additional protection to surface owners. Next slide, please. So this just summarizes our recommendations, um, and I think I've touched on, on all of these, but First of all, that additional resources be put into doing some baseline analysis so that we can, as a state, have a better sense of what the impacts of oil and gas development have been on, on land resources. We're recommending, secondly, that the effectiveness of the voluntary programs that are in place for the lesser prairie chicken and the dune sagebrush lizard be evaluated so that we can just know how effective those tools are going forward and trying to protect additional species through those mechanisms. Again, looking at the advantages and disadvantages of adopting the Surface Damages Act. And then finally, like um, Christine mentioned earlier, Brian mentioned it in his presentation as well, the idea of having better access to data that's interdisciplinary and currently is kind of resides at different uh, places and different state agencies, um, that that data be made more available and accessible to members of the public as well as the industry. And, um, the, you know, interested academics and so on, that that would be a useful mechanism. And that is all I have. Thank you, Melinda. Now we're going to hear from David Allen of the University of Texas at Austin. He was the lead author of the report's chapter on air quality. Thank you, Terrence. Next slide. I'm going to take you through the five findings and one recommendation that are described in the air quality chapter of the TAMIS report. The first finding is that there are a variety of different types of emissions associated with the production of shale resources, including greenhouse gases, photochemical air pollutants, and air toxics. Each of these is discussed in the report. Uh, the images that you see here drawn from the report show mappings on the left of methane emissions nationally from an EPA inventory, and on the right, uh, volatile organic compounds, a type of photochemical air pollutant, again, from an EPA inventory that helped place uh, the emissions that occur in Texas in the context of emissions in other oil and gas production regions. Next slide. Second finding from the air quality section of the report is that recent federal and state regulations have reduced emissions from multiple types of emission sources. Examples at the federal level 
and at the state level are described in this slide uh, and described in detail in the report. They include so-called new source performance standards as well as state actions that can be taken in uh, areas that violate the National Ambient Air Quality Standards for pollutants all done under the Clean Air Act. And I won't describe these in detail. They're described in the report, main finding being that recent regulations have reduced emissions from multiple types of categories. Next slide. A third finding in the report is that emissions in many types of uh, emission categories or source categories associated with shale resource production are associated with a small group of sources. Uh, this uh, is exemplified by two case studies specifically from shale resource production, but I'm going to use a more familiar example that's also cited in the report uh, to perhaps place this in context. It's been known for decades uh, in the air pollution community that for passenger cars, uh, on-road vehicles, uh, that roughly 10% of the vehicles generate 50% of the emissions. And we have similar phenomena in many source categories and including source categories in the oil and gas sector. So a small subpopulation dominates the emissions in a variety of different categories. And again, these are described in detail in the report. Next slide, please. An additional finding is that a number of new technologies have emerged and are continuing to emerge that help the, in the rapid identification of these high emitting sources. And that gives potential uh, to reduce those emissions. Shown in this photograph is an image uh, of uh, a uh, infrared camera being deployed at, an, uh, at a natural gas production site. Uh, this particular technology allows the emissions to be visualized on screen uh, that might not be visible uh, just on inspection of visible light. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other such technologies that are emerging that allow for rapid identification of potential high emitting sources. Next slide. A final finding is that as we consider air quality in the state, it's important to consider not only the emissions associated with oil and gas production, but also the implications of this oil and gas production for how energy is used in the United States and particularly in Texas. One of the principal uses for natural gas, for example, in the United States is electricity generation. And so the broader availability and the lower cost of natural gas that's resulted from many of these uh, shale resources uh, causes changes in energy use. And something that's been seen both nationally and here in Texas is uh, that those changes in price and in some cases regulation have caused a shift from electricity generation using coal to electricity generation using natural gas. And those shifts in how we use energy also have air quality implications. Uh, the fleet of power plants that we have in the state of Texas uh, that generate electricity from coal on average tend to have higher emissions of photochemical air pollutants than the electricity generation plants that use natural gas. And consequently, when we shift to use of more natural gas, we overall, at a statewide level, decrease emissions. Emissions go up in some areas, go down in others, and so these phenomena are complex. A number of case studies are described in the report, but the principal finding here is if we're interested in understanding the overall impact of these resources on air quality, we need to consider not only their production, but also their use. Next slide. Finally, I'll just close with the one recommendation from the air quality chapter, and that is that uh, there's limited information concerning both exposures uh, to air toxics emissions 
and their corresponding health impacts. Uh, in Texas, uh, we've collected extensive data on uh, concentrations of a variety of different air toxics in shale production regions, but in many cases, health effects take, uh, take time to emerge and far fewer data have been taken on health effects and even fewer data still on a combination of emission measurements and uh, corresponding health effects that may be either acute or chronic. Uh, and this is the place where our data are the weakest. And so the recommendation from the air quality section was uh, that targeted research in this area should be conducted. And that uh, ends my description of the findings and recommendations from the air quality chapter. Thank you, David. Our next presentation will be on water. I'm sorry. Our next presentation will be on air quantity and I apologize. Thank you, David. Our next presentation will be on water and we'll be hearing from Michael Young of the University of Texas at Austin. He was one of the co-authors of the chapter on air quantity and quality. Great. Uh, thanks, Terrence. And, uh, um, and so I just want to acknowledge my uh, the, the lead writer, who's Danny Reibel at Texas Tech, and uh, Danny Bullard also at Texas Tech. So that's the uh, the full group. Next slide, please. Uh, the approach that we used on the uh, on the water side of this report was really to look at uh, uh, at issues from all the way from water source to to the sink. So. How is the water being uh, collected and being uh, and being used for hydraulic fracturing and, and uh, oil and gas development? Uh, what what happens when the water uh, is hydraulically uh, is, is used for hydraulic fracturing? And then how do we manage the water coming uh, back as produced water and flow back water? Next slide. Uh, on the water source side, um, you know it's there's. Uh, uh, there's certainly uh, been a lot of discussion uh, right around uh, 2010, 2011, when the state was going through a drought at the same time that oil and gas operations were really ramping up quite a bit. And uh, what we, you know, what we looked at, and, and there's been a fair amount of work done on this, is how much water is really being used for hydraulic fracturing as a, uh, for example, as a percent of total water use across the state. And what we found was that, uh, the, that really the total freshwater use here, this is water that would be used for communities, things of that nature, for irrigation, for ag, um, was really less than 1% of the total water use across the state. So when you look at it from an, an, an entire statewide um, assessment, it's a relatively small amount of, uh, of the total water use. And, and the, this has actually been decreasing because uh, operators have been making very effective use of brackish water and produced water um, for for new new fracturing operations, but you know when you really scale down to the community, um, and uh, then then that percentage starts to to go up, and in some communities the the amount of water being used for hydraulic fracturing is 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 really a large much larger percent of the total water use being in communities, especially for those where there's not um, a lot of irrigated ag. So for those those areas, you know, using produced water and brackish water substantially reduces the pressure on freshwater resources. And this has been, uh, this has been discussed in, in uh, the literature, it's been discussed in, in the peer review uh, papers quite a bit on how, um, and how innovation in terms of the chemistry of the fracturing, um, uh, the fracturing fluids has really been improved so that uh, much higher um, concentration of, of salts in the water can be used for hydraulic fracturing. Next slide. So if we if we then go from water source to what happens when the water is actually injected, um, this the chart on the right shows uh, it, it, it shows depth uh, uh, on the left axis and uh, and on the right it shows uh, you know really the difference between uh, where the fractures are occurring. So those those lines there of different colors are those are essentially the fractures that are estimated using microseismic arrays. And uh, the blue lines at the top is the depth of the of potable water. And you, what you're looking at there are several thousand feet of rock uh, between the fractured zone and the uh, and the potable water. And uh, and so you know that that provides a tremendous buffering capacity and a protection level for potable water. And to our knowledge, there's no um, instances in the state of Texas where 
uh, potable, shore, potable groundwater has been impacted by hydraulic fracturing. And, uh, and so it's very unlikely um, that this is going to be happening. And of, and of course, the processes themselves and uh, the method of, of doing of, of well construction and hydraulic fracturing processes have improved quite a bit. So um, we see that as, as being a very low likelihood. But uh, it's, really the, it's really the management of the water uh, once it comes back to ground surface that's, uh, that, that requires an extra look. And, and we des describe this quite a bit. Um, next slide, please. So the produced water quality, uh, this is the water that is co-produced with oil and gas. We know that that water is, uh, is fairly saline. It has uh, uh, somewhere on the, um, uh, somewhere 100,000 parts per million, which is like three times uh, the salinity of seawater. So it's fairly saline. And, and treating this water uh, using desalination, for example, is very difficult to do. And in some cases, it's not, it's not possible. And very often, it's not economically feasible to do that, just given the cost of desalination. So the water needs to be managed in a way that uh, uh, reduces the likelihood of spills. Um, there are, are choices that operators are using and that people are using for managing the produced water, whether they put it in, in trucks or in pipelines or it's, or, or it's injected into uh, um, injected into wells, uh, similar to what uh, Brian Stump was describing uh, in regard to induced seismicity. So there are, are sort of upsides and downsides to each one of those decisions. Um, but certainly there is a, there's a handling issue with these fluids. And, uh, uh, and right now in, in the state of Texas, the reporting on, on the potential for spills or, or reporting of spills is not as stringent as, as it is in other states. And so if we go to the next slide where we have uh, conclusions here, um, you know, the last bullet, I'll just start with the last bullet just to segue in, that, that the spill and leak reporting, it's not required by statute, uh, and it varies by different districts in the state of Texas. So having a uniform spill reporting uh, requirement or protocol would, I think, help quite a bit for us to better understand uh, how prevalent this is, uh, it, you know, what are the risks, and how can we uh, better manage that water once it, once it uh, reaches ground surface when it's co-produced uh, to avoid the... Uh, uh, avoid this in the future. So really, you know, the using in terms of water resource recommendations, that there's a lot of data that's been collected on this, uh, similar to the air quality. Um, and we know that, uh, that, that just innovation alone is making a huge difference in terms of using brackish water and using produced water for refracturing operations so that, uh, um, and so that that water doesn't have to be managed so much above ground. Uh, and that brackish water resources, we really need to continue to quantify what those resources are, uh, how they can be used for communities, uh, for energy development where, uh, where it's appropriate. Um, and so uh, overall, we'll just continue to, uh, um, to innovate and to reduce pressure on, on uh, fresh water. And uh, I believe that's the last slide, and I'm happy to hand this back over to Terrence. Thanks, Michael, for those findings and recommendations on water. We have uh, two presentations left. One will be on transportation and then uh, social and economic impacts. After that, we're going to have about 15 minutes for Q&A. And as a reminder, you can uh, submit those questions through the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, we've got a few in, and we're hoping for uh, some more as we get closer to the Q&A portion. Now we're going to be hearing from John Barton of Texas A&M University System. He was the lead author of the chapter on transportation. John. Thank you, Terrence, and uh, thank you for a chance to brief you on this chapter. I would like to start by recognizing the great work of uh, Cesar Caroga with the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, who is a co-author on this chapter with me. The high-level reality that we observed and found in this review is that uh, the current technologies that we depend upon for oil and gas production and development in these areas of hydraulic fracturing creates a large volume of heavy truck traffic in areas of the state which are predominantly rural and because of that they are traveling along roadways and highways that were secondary in nature by their design and were never intended to or designed and constructed to sustain these heavier truck traffic volumes related with this and so the consequence is that they've accelerated pavement and bridge deterioration and roadside impacts. Uh, next slide please. And so when you look at the consequences uh, 
in terms of photographic evidence, this is the type of impact that is seen throughout these regions. You see significant pavement failures. Oftentimes these narrower roadways do not have the width to sustain the traffic, so you start to see significant edge impacts. And virtually you start to have impacts that transcend off the roadway and throughout the entire rights of way that these uh, particular corridors are carried on. Next slide. And it's, it's not just the volume of traffic, of heavy truck traffic in these areas, but it's also a matter of the impacts of the weight, which is something that is not relatively intuitive to many of us. Uh, this is just a representation of how the, as the weight of a truck that is traveling on a roadway increases, the impact on the roadway goes up exponentially. And so I've highlighted on this particular chart a couple of examples, for instance, a normal 18-wheeler, as most of us refer to a tractor-trailer unit, uh, that would weigh 35,000 pounds when it's empty, when it weighs 84,000 pounds, which is the legally permittable load in the state of Texas at this time, does 38 times the amount of roadway consumption or damage than it does when it's empty. And then uh, also looking at a lot of the trucks that in these regions and for this particular activity are weighted up to 100,000 pounds or more because they are carrying such large equipment and, and payloads, um, a 100,000 pound truck when it's compared to an 84,000 pound truck does 240 percent more damage or, or impact than an 80,000 pound legal load in the state of Texas. So if you go to the next slide, when you look at the financial consequence of these heavy truck traffic volumes on these low volume roads and on city streets and county roads collectively they are causing about two billion dollars worth of year uh, two billion dollars per year of impacts uh, to repair these roads streets and county roads throughout the state of Texas where these impacts are occurring and not only is there a financial consequence to this truck traffic on the infrastructure there's also a cost to the industry uh, when these types of impacts are unable to be addressed uh, as much or more than the impacts uh, on the infrastructure itself due to equipment damage, wear and tear on vehicles, and lower operating act, uh, speed activities uh, as much as $3.5 billion per year. And uh, In addition to these, if we go to the next slide, there is the uh, reality of the human consequence. Um, as we've seen these traffic volumes in these producing areas increase uh, because of the influx of workers and equipment necessary to develop and produce these wells. Uh, we've also seen uh, a corollary or, or relating increase in traffic accidents. Uh, of course, as traffic volumes go up, accidents will go up as well. Um, in these areas, looking at the, a four-year prior to and four-year uh, period when these activities were occurring in the Eagle Ford and Permian Basins most recently, we saw uh, over a 50% increase in the total number of crashes in a lot of these rural counties. Uh, that also uh, correlated to about a 75% or greater increase in the number of fatal crashes. And of course, in addition to the tra tragic emotional toll that these crashes cause, there are large financial consequences as well. And so the traffic safety issue is one of the most pressing concerns that we found as a consequence of these uh, activities and certainly ones that state and, and local government agencies are looking to address. If we go to the next slide then, just to kind of summarize the transportation review, the major takeaways were that there are extremely large volumes of heavy truck loads necessary to produce and develop these wells and that the infrastructure that we currently have in place in terms of roads and bridges just were not designed to carry or accommodate those larger increases in truck traffic nor the size of the vehicles themselves. And that relates in, uh, or excuse me, uh, results in uh, impacts to the infrastructure itself as well as increases in traffic crashes. Uh, the good news is that the ability to address them in terms of the financial cost associated with making those improvements would be relatively low in terms of the positive impacts they would have on the infrastructure and the communities they serve. And so the last slide, if you'll move forward, is that we would recommend uh, 
as we move forward that the ability to have better data and larger volumes of data about where the industry may be moving would be beneficial to the state and local jurisdictions as they plan infrastructure improvements. That thoughtful consideration around developing integrated and multimodal transportation infrastructure solutions would be incredibly valuable to distribute these increasing traffic volumes across pipelines, railways, waterways, and roadways, and that being able to have a reliable and sustainable funding stream to accommodate these infrastructure improvements would allow us to uh, more effectively provide the solutions necessary for the further development of these oil and gas uh, resources across the state of Texas. So Terrence, that's a, a very quick review of Chapter 7 on transportation, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, John. We're now going to have our last presentation from Omar Garcia with the South Texas Energy and Economic Roundtable, who co-authored co the chapter on social and economic impacts. After Omar is finished, we're going to move to our Q&A. And as a reminder, you can submit questions in the question bar in GoToWebinar. Omar. Thank you, Terrence. Uh, just like to thank Gene Theodore and Urs Kuder uh, for also being part of this section. Um, when we were evaluating some of the studies that are out there, there's no question that hydraulic fracturing has had a net positive uh, impact to the Texas economy. You see it when you go through rural Texas, uh, whether it's in the Permian Basin or the Eagle Fruit of the Haynesville, you see the changes that have happened uh, over the last 10 years with new infrastructure, new schools, new housing developments. There's been a lot of positive impacts. But on the same side, you've also seen limited data as well, too, on the benefits and the cost of shale energy development. Uh, you've also seen we've had some impacts with anything with a, an impact this big. You're bound to see some impacts that we've seen throughout this presentation, whether it's on roads, uh, workforce, uh, air. You're bound to see some impacts uh, with uh, an industry that has had such a great impact on the state of Texas. Next slide. Um, one of the biggest takeaways that we from our research was how impactful the industry has been on school districts, uh, universities across Texas, um, and the royalty and revenue paid by the oil and gas industry. Uh, there are things that have transformed new schools, uh, new opportunities for rural South Texas, uh, new opportunities for rural West Texas. There's just been a lot of opportunities for people in these regions, and it's because of the revenue that has been associated with the development and exploration of oil and gas. With that said, uh, the economic benefits associated with the oil and gas development are unevenly distributed across public schools and universities. So you're seeing some schools, some areas benefit more than others, but there's just not a lot of research to go into further talking about that. Next slide. Um, social impacts, a lot of what we saw through the studies is that Texas likes and appreciates the industry. They like the jobs, uh, they like the service industry jobs that are associated. They all like the new retail opportunities, whether um, it's a new HEB or a new Walmart that may not be possible uh, in these rural South Texas communities. They do like that, um, but then they don't like the social and environmental effects that accompany it, uh, whether it's traffic, um, whether it's environmental, uh, there are some things that we as an industry and Texans are going to work with the oil and gas industry to mitigate any potential issues. Next slide. Um, the oil and gas industry is viewed as a relatively trustworthy source for information on shell development and hydraulic fracturing. Uh, instances where the industry works with the communities, where you have trade associations working with the community, openly asking um, and answering questions, working to mitigate any issues, you see a very good relationship um, where you tend to see uh, the negative impact is where sometimes questions aren't being answered or there's not enough information out there, but you're seeing a lot of information from social media, uh, web pages, get as much information as we can about what the oil and gas industry is doing in the state of Texas. Next slide. Uh, social impacts. Uh, we talked about some on the study is decisions regarding setback distances in Texas uh, that are established in, at the municipal level, uh, and shell development has the potential to disappropriately affect certain segments of the population. Next slide. 
some of the recommendations uh, that we uh, came up with, the economic benefits and costs and associated equity issues or winners and losers in shale energy development, uh, underlying factors accompanying the formation of both positive and negative perceptions of shale development, uh, and various factors that may be associated with behavior taken in response or anticipation of shale development. Next slide. Potential environmental and health effects associated with varying setback distances, uh, the uneven distribution of benefits and costs associated with the developments. And just to wrap it up, the, the impact has been um, something that we never thought we'd see the oil and gas industry, but as we move forward, we want to make sure that we work on some of these issues moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Omar, and thanks to everyone else who's presented on the call today. Uh, we also want to take a moment and uh, uh, just acknowledge that this project was uh, convened and sponsored by TAMIS, but we also had some crucial generous support from the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation, and we thank them for their sponsorship of this project. Now we're going to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder, you can submit your questions through the webinar uh, question panel. And the first question comes from the Dallas Morning News, and it's, uh, the question is, how long did this study take to conduct? And we're going to have Christine Economides from the University of Houston. She was the chair of the Shale Task Force answer this question for us. Christine. Thanks, Terrence, and thanks for the question. Uh, this report started from an effort uh, to develop a conference on more or less the same subject matter, uh, but everyone felt uh, the need for a report to capture what people were saying. And it evolved into the idea that maybe we should actually put the focus on the report. We did do a conference, uh, an open meeting uh, to inform uh, the uh, task force members on uh, what materials are available to us, uh, but we, we decided to put the effort on an actual report. Uh, this is a first-time effort for Texas and for TAMEST. Uh, to develop a report of this sort, and we patterned it, as I mentioned, after uh, National Academy efforts. Uh, so it took us about a year to develop a statement of task, uh, specifying the scope of the report, and uh, acquire some funding, including uh, from Mitchell Foundation and from TAMEST, and uh, getting the approval of the TAMEST board, all of these things. Uh, finally, when all of that was in place, uh, it took us about another year to actually uh, decide on the task force membership, collect the resources, and write the report. Thanks, Christine. Our next question comes from State Impact Pennsylvania. Given that this study is based on pre-existing research, does it break any new ground, or is it just a summation of existing science? If it's the latter, what are its goals? And we'll start with Christine Economides, the chair, again, answering this question, and other task force representatives may want to chime in after she's finished. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for this question as well. Uh, so I guess I would start with a slight piece of humor, but, you know, in an era of alternative facts, this report is bringing together much or most of the scientific evidence uh, about the actual impacts of shale development. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about hydraulic fracturing in particular. Uh, we hope that the information in this report is going to be helpful for Texans and I think beyond uh, to the nation and perhaps even internationally. Um, the resources in Texas are very large and they're likely to de be developed for many decades in the future. Uh, so it's really important to learn from the experience so far uh, so that we can see how it informs uh, improved methods and uh, technologies and um, uh, minimizing impacts on the people all of the, and the environment, all of these things uh, for the future. Okay, thank you, Christine. Karen, yes, please, go ahead. Okay. This this is John Barton, and I would just add to what Christine has always already shared that uh, you know this whole issue around the development of these 
very beneficial resources is a complicated and complex matter. And one of the previous uh, early slides in this presentation, they showed that ecosystem uh, represented uh, that looked at these various aspects of the industry and, and how it has unfolded over the past several years. And taking all of this information, combining it into a report that looks at these variable uh, aspects of the industry and, and how it interrelates with the ecosystem that it exists within across these communities, I think is very beneficial and helpful for policymakers and for communities as we move forward because in any complex system like this, there are trade-offs as you make decisions and hopefully this will allow us to look at uh, all the solutions that are out there and understand that as we migrate in one direction or another, there are positive and perhaps not so positive consequences in other areas. And so given a chance to look at it from a systems perspective, I think is incredibly valuable. And part of what I hope this report is able to do for the readers and users of this information moving forward. Thanks, John. Our next question is addressed to the one of the authors of the chapter on water. And uh, for Michael Young, you said that the spill reporting requirements vary by district. Can you clarify, do you mean the Texas Railroad Commission districts? And that's from E&E &E News. Yes, that's correct. There's no, that, that right now it's, it's, a, it's done by Railroad Commission district, not, uh, uh, that, that was my meaning. Okay, and the next question is on transportation, also from E&E &E News. Uh, you mentioned the need for a stable funding source to fund road repairs and construction. Do you have any more detailed recommendations? Should the cost be borne by local taxpayers, statewide taxpayers, the companies themselves? Yeah, and this is John Barton, and uh, you know, as, as I think as we look at this in Texas, we've been fortunate that in recent legislation, uh, legislative sessions, uh, the legislature and then the citizens in Texas have voted to increase funding for transportation globally, and a big part of that comes from the resources that are made available through the severance taxes paid by the oil and gas industry uh, in these areas and across the state. Uh, the, the leadership at the legislat legislature and at the Texas Department of Transportation and in many of these cities and counties have in turn taken those resources and directed them toward improvements to address these issues that this report identified. Other places around the country uh, potentially have that same opportunity, but I think the primary point is that as these uh, industries are developing, it's important to be thoughtful about identifying where those resources might come from and then directing them towards this work. There will always be competing interest for the use of the limited resources that we have through public and private sources, and, and really the thought was that we need to be mindful of the potential consequences and impacts of these activities and to be thinking about how to provide those uh, revenues and resources necessary to provide for them. Uh, so again, in summary, in Texas, uh, we've been blessed with this opportunity through the state voters and the leadership at, at our legislative level, as well as local communities. Uh, that type of proactive thought is important, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that in this report we highlighted that it is critical to be able to address those issues. Thanks, John. We had a follow-up question for Michael on the spill reporting question. How do the spill reporting requirements vary by district? Yeah, so um, right now there's, uh, there, there's no, these are all known as reportable quantities. Uh, and, and to my knowledge, and I'm not part of the regulatory community here, that, that uh, um, there's no there's no reportable quantity value that's codified for, for produced water, and that's what we're talking about. Um, they tend to vary across uh, the district somewhere between 25 to 100 barrels, uh, but uh, I, I don't have direct knowledge of, of what those, uh, of which districts have which reportable quantities. Um, there's, uh, my suggestion for, for E&E &E News and for others is to contact the individual district offices or the Railroad Commission to get specifics. But uh, to my knowledge, there's, it's not a codified value that's applied uniformly across the state. Thanks, Michael. 
Uh, we have one last question here, and I think it's a good one to end on. It's from the Dallas Morning News. It seems like a theme running through this report is that there needs to be more research. How much do you think we understand, and how significant are the gaps? And once again, we'll start with Christine Economides, the chair of the task force, and if other authors want to weigh in after she's finished as well, please do. That's a hard one for me. <laughs> um, I, th I think uh, a lot is understood, and um, I have a, a long industry background, so perhaps this influences my remarks here. Uh, but, you know, it's important to to look at those things that have the greatest impact uh, and make sure we answer the ones um, that that really must be answered, the questions I mean. Uh, so um, how significant are the gaps? Again, I look at this um, very much from the perspective of just how large and important these resources are uh, to Texas and even the country uh, because uh, we really do uh, thrive on the availability of energy uh, in the United States. Uh, so um, if we find that there are barriers, significant barriers that should put a stop to this kind of development, and the impacts are huge. So I guess that's the way I would look at the gaps, uh, where, where there are things that uh, could threaten uh, the future for this kind of development. Uh, those are the things that really we must uh, address. Hi, and this Thanks, is Mike. Christine. I have a, a, just, a, just a follow on um, to what Christine was saying. Um, for for the for the for the folks that, that are really looking at this, the, the last chapter of the report, um, I think Christine brought it up earlier. One of the things we really try to do is to look at how the different um, the sort of these different areas uh, intersect with one another and how they're connected. And um, to, to me, that is a, a, a unique aspect of the report in that we really tried to see. Um, and, and essentially sort of advocate for, for looking at uh, responses and analyses in a continuum of the other scientific themes. We don't want to do, for example, making decisions on water with, uh, outside of consideration of land and communities and, and transportation um, basically doesn't allow us to, to always make the right decision because we're not making, we're not considering these other aspects. So um, in, in, my, in my mind, what, what really makes the report interesting and where we're able to identify some of the gaps in knowledge is just how, um, how, how does making decisions on water management in, impact transportation? How does that impact communities? How does, um, you know, and, and air and, and, uh, and land and things like that? To, to me, that, that's one of the benefits, of, the real benefits of the report, and it, and it also kind of highlights areas where we need um, to do additional work. Thanks, Michael, and thanks everyone for participating today. We're glad you could join us. We want to remind you that the report is now available at tamis.org slash shale task force, and we're going to be having an archive of this webinar with the slides and the audio up on our website shortly. We'd encourage you to read the report and also remind you that the authors, uh, the participants on this call today will be available for follow-up interviews. Uh, we'll be sharing with uh, members of the media their contact information, but you can also feel free to get in touch with us here at TAMIS to arrange any interviews today. Thank you again for your time, and thank you for joining us today. That concludes this call.